Church Conference. Um, today's um, speaker probably needs no introduction since most of you know him. Um, in fact, uh, you know, usually I have a piece of paper when I introduce the speaker, but I know him well enough that I don't <laughs> need that. Um, anyways, um, uh, Steve Bedrick, who um, is a um, somewhat recent graduate of our program and now um, uh, is doing very well as a uh, faculty member here, mostly in the um, Center for Spoken Language Understanding, but also in um, uh, our department in DMICE, uh, is uh, going to come and give us an update on um, all of his research. So um, Steve is a, a native of the area, uh, grew up here, um, went off to Colorado College, and then came and did his uh, PhD in our program. Uh, uh, funded under the NLM training grant, and um, I think he had a really good advisor. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then um, uh, was um, uh, brought on by uh, CSLU, uh, where he's continued work in um, uh, NLP text mining and, and a variety of topics, and uh, continues to work uh, with uh, the department and so forth, and so he's going to give us an update on his research. Is this thing going? Can people hear me? Yes? All right. Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming, and thanks for the introduction, Bill. Um, uh, as Bill said, uh, I'm on the faculty of the Center for Spoken Language Understanding, and uh, we'll be talking today about some of my recent research. I'll be talking about kind of two, area, two big sort of project areas, one on medical information retrieval and another on assistive technologies for primary progressive aphasia. Um, so, First, I wanted to really quickly do a slide about CSLU just because I, I know that not everybody at OHSU knows that we exist or what we do. Um, so we are a center under the Institute on Disability and Development, which is sort of what the CDRC turned into some years back. And uh, our sort of major area of, of focus is on um, algorithms for speech and language technology, but also signal, general signal processing uh, for, of, of biomedical signals and then applying those technologies to uh, uh, typically diagnosis or assessment technologies, but also uh, reme remediation as well. And, and we have uh, a, a really actually quite diverse faculty in terms of research areas. We have speech people, we have Im image processing people, we have machine learning folks, we have NLP people like me, and we, have, uh, we work in a, a wide variety of sort of medical, medical domains. Um, you know, there's my own work in AAC and IR, but we also have um, a big project on uh, automating assessment of autism. We have projects on studying uh, language and speech use of people, uh, of people who are aging to try to detect mild cognitive impairment. Um, really a, quite a wide, wide variety of, of projects. If anybody's interested, you know, I'm, we're, we're always happy to talk. Um, so uh, we also have a MS and PhD program in computer science and electrical engineering that we're hoping to find more ways to plug in with DMICE and, and vice versa on that. And several of us actually have joint appointments in DMICE. So part of me coming today is hopefully trying to you know, b build more connections between our groups. Um, so that was just the quick preliminary there. Uh, and so the, the, the two projects I'll be talking about for my work are, um, again, information retrieval and then uh, aphasia and AAC. So, um, information retrieval uh, plays a really important role in, in biomedicine. Um, uh, focusing today on sort of medical aspects, and there's a number of different ways that IR plays a role. Some of them may be more or less expected. So from a patient's perspective, there's all kinds of information needs that arise when you're sort of going through your life as a patient. You know, what's this funny looking rash on my arm? How high should my fever get before I go to the doctor? Uh, my doctor says the rash is idiopathic. What does that even mean? Um, does my new skin medication have side effects, and so on and so forth. Lots of things that patients might be searching for inf information on. Uh, providers also have information needs and use IR systems to address them. Um, what is this funny looking rash on my patient's arm? <laughs> right? uh, it's actually quite surprising how often doctors use Google these days, right? Um, uh, is this new drug for treating dermatitis better than the old drug? Uh, what proportion of patients on the, on the new drug experience a certain side effect or group of side effects? You know, are there any other patients in my, in my practice or in my patient panel um, who've tried that drug and what happened to them uh, when they did? Um, so these are all uh, uh, can be fit into a few different categories of, of, of information need, right? Q question answering style searching, you know, what is this rash? 
uh, searching over EHR records. So we have a collection of patients, and we want to find things that happened in their visits um, using text search. Uh, clinical decision support, so having a system somehow uh, in, you know, infer what information will be relevant to a, to a provider at a, at a given point during the care process and then you know, presenting it to them in some way. Um, searching through biomedical literature for you know, research purposes or for treatment purposes. And then um, sort of uh, another buzzword, the cohort development or cohort discovery, right? We have uh, a big database of patients and we have some description of, of patients that we want to identify a subset of, you know, patients who are on this drug, who are between this age and that age, who have a diagnosis of X, Y, or Z, you know, usually for trial development, um, but also for general epidemiological research and uh, um, quality improvement, all, all those kinds of classic informatics uh, things that one might want, might want to do. And IR plays, of course, a key role in all of this. Um, from a sort of computer science standpoint, the medical domain poses a number of very interesting IR challenges. So uh, compared to general web search, uh, medical language has a lot of uh, extreme synonymy. There's lots of different ways to say the same thing and lots of jargon and uh, um, to a degree that you don't often see in, in, in many other IR domains. Um, you know, how, how, many, how many different ways are there uh, to describe a heart attack? You know, well, the UMLS has probably a half dozen different words that, that depend, you know, that all to a greater or lesser extent might refer to a heart attack. Um, then if you've ever read, say, clinical notes, thinking more, fo fo focusing a bit more on searching over clinical records, um, there's often very quirky and obscure ways that doctors word their notes. Uh, and, 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 and then they do this not to make searching hard, but because they're communicating generally for an audience of other professionals, and there's a, a, a rich and uh, long-standing linguistic tradition within medicine of how you write a note, right? And, and, and the way they write a note, Paul Garman can go on for hours about how the, the, the way that you write a note or the, the words you choose to use or not use can, will, will themselves communicate something independent of the actual words you chose, right? If you word it one way, the, a doctor reading it will, have, will be, able, be able to interpret it at a, at a deeper level um, than, than somebody who didn't know about that sort of linguistic uh, background. And um, you know, again, general web search uh, doesn't tend to have that as much. Um, getting more specific, there'll be lots of complicated edema, uh, sorry, complicated negation um, expressions, right? So if you're just searching for you know, patients that had edema and you're going on keyword search, you will you know, be triggered by things that say no sign of edema, which of course is the opposite of what you want. Um, Negation is always a problem in NLP, but it's a particularly big problem when searching over medical notes because um, of the amazing variety of ways that doctors have to express negation. Um, uh, and then heavy use of passive voice, which makes some kinds of syntactic analysis more challenging. Uh, the, again, the absence of a concept might itself be important, right? A, a, a doctor reading, a, reading a, um, a report of a physical exam will know what things they, you know, looking at the section, say, on head and neck, they're, they're going to know the, the 20 things that are involved in a head and neck exam, and the fact that 18 of those weren't mentioned is going to communicate something to the doctor, um, right? They're gonna, it's going to communicate that those 18 things were not notable and were not important. Um, and figuring out how to kind of capture that is, is, is very um, challenging, right? So uh, thinking more generally, um, the information needs, as we saw in the, in the examples before, are very um, diverse, and they can be very complicated and hard to express. They can also be ambiguous. Um, it's, it's different from shopping, you know, searching for product reviews, where you generally know more or less exactly what you're trying to find out. It isn't always clear what you're looking for if you're looking for patients that had a certain problem. Um, you know, there's probably a lot of other contextual information that you know about your need that, that might not get expressed in the query that you might not even know how to express. Uh, Obviously, the quantities of data can be quite large. Um, that's uh, often it's not web scale as such, but it can still be large enough to be difficult, and it can also be large enough to be large enough that it's hard to know how to present to a user. And then there's this interesting mix of structured and unstructured data. So a clinical record will have obviously a, a free text progress note, but it'll also have, you know, a dozen or two dozen structured elements. You know, te lab test results. Um, coded problem list entries, any kind of, you know, blood pressure readings, any, any, anything that, you know, might go and say a, a, a flow chart and epic, you know, will be captured hopefully in some kind of structured form. And many information needs can make use of both structured and, uh, and unstructured information. Traditional text IR generally ignores the unstructured information or doesn't have a, a, a as, as straightforward of a framework for, for fitting it in. So 
that's part of why medical IR is so interesting to me from, from an IR standpoint. Um, thus far, most of what I've done with medical IR has, has sort of been in the context of, of these shared tasks. So as a, as a field, even, even more than most CS fields, IR has this really strong, rich tradition of evaluation, empirical evaluation, um, and, and doing empirical evaluations with shared tasks where you get many researchers together, you have a common data set, you have a common set of queries, we all run our systems on the queries, and then we have a way to meaningfully compare our results. And starting when I was doing my PhD with Bill, I got involved in a number of these um, shared tasks. And OHSU's participated both as a uh, team submitting queries, but also on the administrative side, helping to organize shared tasks and collect relevance judgments. And that's been um, a big way that I've been involved. Uh, two big kind of families of, of shared tasks that have uh, application in biomedicine are, are TREC, which is the text retrieval uh, uh, evaluation conference, which has been going on for Actually, I think it's just the text retrieval conference, now that I think about it. Um, it's been going on for well over 20 years. Um, and it's run by the National Institutes of Standard, Standards and Technology. And they have uh, tracks that cover a wide variety of kinds of IR, you know, general web search all the way down to you know, hyper-specific you know, genomic stuff that OGSU ran for a number of years. The last several years, they've had medical tracks as well. And then another. Uh, large set of, of campaigns or, or, or shared tasks, or source for shared tasks is the CLAY um, series. It's the cross, excuse me, the cross language evaluation form. And it actually grew out of TREC, but now is sort of its own thing and uh, is more European focused and focuses on, again, usually multilingual search problems. The last couple of years, they've also had medical tracks. So multilingual medical data and multilingual medical uh, uh, queries and searching over, um, over both. And we've been involved um, in, in a number of these. The uh, one I'll be talking about today grew out of the track med track. It was focused on medical record retrieval. And the idea there was uh, in 2012, it was the idea was, was sort of case identification for cohort discovery um, from a free text description. So we might have a, a description like patients treated for lower extremity chronic wounds. And we had a corpus of uh, about 90,000 de-identified um, encounters that, that they're sort of the progress note from, from um, either progress notes, emergency room notes, surgical uh, reports, and I think pathology reports um, for about 17,000 visits. So each visit might have multiple encounters. And the idea was to identify from those 17,000 visits ones that were responsive um, to that query. We, um, oh, right, sorry, we, we also had ICD codes for them. So there, there was that mix of structured and unstructured data. Uh, our system, it, does, it looks like it fell off the back of a truck, ignore that. Uh, but I would point out it's, it's interactive in a way that most people doing these tracks don't bother making interactive <coughs> systems. So that's something, a way that OHSU has distinguished itself over the years. Um, the, 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 the idea was, you know, you could type in your query and get a result. We used Lucene, which is an open source um, search package. Um, so you put in a query, it searches through the notes, and we get, uh, you know, this was a query for the word monkey, and, and, and what comes out is a note where somebody has a past history of an injury from falling off of the monkey bars. So not actually relevant to, to you know, it, it's, it's sort, of, sort of actually a good, a good example of, 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 of why searching is, is tricky over notes, right? So that's something from the past medical history, not, not about the uh, immediate purpose of the visit, which is probably relevant, probably an important thing to know if you're wanting to um, decide whether the article is relevant or not. So anyway, we had the system. Um, it took the free text queries and then used Metamap, which is a tool from the National Library of Medicine uh, that takes free text and identifies UMLS concepts in that free text. Uh, it's basically a named entity recognizer that's been tuned to work on this kind of text and work against the UMLS. And uh, so the idea was it would take something like patients treated for depression after myocardial infarction and basic map it to ICD codes, but also take depressive disorders or mental depression and myocardial infarction or infarct or any of the other dozens of other ones. Um, this approach uh, was pretty simplistic, right? It's, it's, it's basically a, a, a bag of words approach in that it does, it's not taking into account anything about the structure of the sentence, right? Um, it's just saying, are these terms present and trying to be a little bit more clever about what terms to include and also taking advantage of that structured information because we did have discharge notes. Um, and uh, it varied the performance. Uh, Metamap actually does have negation capability. We, we didn't use it for this. We, we should have. <laughs> um, 
and, uh, and, and actually did later on. But, but uh, it, it's unclear also how good its negation um, detection is. It, it can get simple negation pretty well, um, more complex negation, less so. Uh, there's other negation detection things out there, though, for sure. Um, the, 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 the idea of uh, how to incorporate negation detection into something like this is also a little bit tricky. Um, so again, if it's, if it's a simple query, you can just sort of Boolean not out the term that it detects as being negated. But as, 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 as we'll see, when the, when the queries get more complicated, that, that approach starts to, to, to fail. Um, but, um, but anywho, the important thing is just that the performance was OK, but uh, varied widely by topic. That's, that's actually pretty common. Um, we had the system built. And then in 2014, they went and changed the task on us. <laughs> Um, in 2014, uh, some th the, the, the place we were getting the uh, notes from decided that they no longer wanted those notes to be available for research, um, and clamped down. The, 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 basically, the, their, their, their lawyers clamped down, and uh, Trek had to, the people at NIST had to scramble to, to, re to rejigger the task, um, and so the task was a little bit different. Now uh, the document collection is PubMed Central from the open access uh, subset, so they're published literature articles. And, the pa and now we have, instead of quick snippets of a patient, we actually have a full discharge, like a, a, full, a full, not discharge, sorry, but a full summary of the patient, right? Um, complete sentences, complicated sentences written in, met, you know, with, with medical, what I, I guess what I would think of as medical syntax, right? Um, and so we have to go from that to uh, come up with potentially uh, appropriate um, articles. The, the sort of motivating theme was, a, where it was being modeled as, as, as a decision support problem, right? So maybe the EHR can generate the summary, or maybe the summary is in the EHR somewhere, and we want to show the provider articles that might be relevant to their treatment. Uh, it's unclear how, re how realistic that scenario is, but that's sort of the, the, um, the, the, the one they went with and the one they're going with again this year. So we tried our old approach and got terrible results. And uh, they were terrible for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, everybody got bad results. It's actually a really hard task. And part of the reason it's so hard is any of these kinds of automated query generating, you know, any of these, any of these things that like take text and try to come up with it when it's something like a query, when the query is this long, uh, if you're just looking, like picking out terms, you're going to get a million terms, and most of them aren't actually going to be relevant. And barring any other information of how those terms relate to each other, uh, it's not at all clear how to put it together into some kind of query. Aaron? It is a hard task for a human being, and the relevance judgment was challenging. We had, uh, what about a dozen or so uh, um, MDs? Um, maybe like about 20. Yeah, maybe more like 20 um, MDs. So, OK, the way TREC usually does relevance judgment is um, the, the you might start by just taking your entire document, document collection and going through all of them and saying whether they're relevant or not for the query. That's unfeasible because we have 100,000 documents. So what they do is everybody um, does their, runs their system, and you have, say, 20 different people's systems results. And then what you do is you pool them together, and you take the articles that were most frequently retrieved, and you make a sort of meta set of, of articles that is a more, a more attractive size, say, 500 or 1,000. And then you have human judges look over those. So uh, some people's articles that their systems retrieved never got judged and therefore get counted as not relevant, which is a, a sort of problem with that style of, of evaluation. But it's, it's kind of the best system anybody's uh, come, up with, come up with yet. So for this one, um, the, many of the topics didn't have very many relevant documents at all, which was um, a challenging aspect of it. Um, yeah? Yes. And when I'm presented with a, you know, with a clinical situation, I request it. Case reports are generally not something I'm ever looking at it at yep. when I have a clinical encounter. Absolutely. Yeah. And that sort of gets back to what I was saying about how 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 realistic was the scenario. Um, I know that it was a, it was a subject of much discussion among the, the track organizers. And, and there was also a lot of uh, variation across the judges, which is not uncommon in these judgment tasks. But Absolutely. It was, a lot in this one. There was there was a lot. So it's a part of that's actually honestly part of what makes that medical IR so interesting to me is a, is the evaluation story is actually really hard to it's hard to do and it's interesting. Um, so this was the entire case report. Is this? I mean, 
this this is this is the query, and and so the idea was to find articles, and, and many of them from the, it does happen that many of the articles in the PubMed uh, Central Open Access uh, uh, Open Access subset are case reports, um, and so the idea was to find case reports that looked like that. Aaron. Oh, we didn't have primary discharge problems, but Bill, can you speak to that a little bit, since you were? Yeah, the you, you know this was actually a, a pretty. Uh, I mean, is we're we're probably. Yeah, I am. He is. <laughs> the lights on. I always use the mic. I remind people to use the mic. <laughs> uh oh. Well, come on, guys, get with the okay. program. So Aaron's question was about um, the, uh, uh, the the guidance given to the judges. You know, I I, I think we might be. Uh, th this is a very complex question, but uh, to, just to get to the gist of it, um, we, the, we did give them guidance. It was um, hard to give them um, a lot of uh, detailed guidance, but um, I, I mean, I think like what Steve just said is that, you know, they got all kinds of different types of articles out of the medical literature, and those of you who know all about evidence-based medicine, that there's, you know, different levels of evidence, and we didn't really go into that, which was a limitation um, of the task. We're, since this task is going to be run again this coming year, um, we're hopefully going to address these. The, the one saving grace in all this, um, I don't know if you plan to mention this, but um, it, it turns out that relevance judgments don't matter that much because uh. um, when you have different judgments done by different people, the systems that do better with one set of judgments tend to do better with um, other sets of judgments. Right. So, I mean, it's important to get good judgments, but it's it's not a um, it doesn't kill the whole thing that you don't yeah. have perfect ones. If you have one set of judgments and another set of judgments, the absolute differences in scores will be different, but the relative rankings of the different systems will be usually preserved. Um, so, anyway, that's a whole other topic, and I do I'm, I'm going to actually move on. Um, but I could also, as you can see, talk about evaluation of this stuff for a very long time uh, as needed. So um, so we decided uh, uh, that we needed to do something a little bit more sophisticated. Um, we began by asking why our previous system underperformed. And one of the things we identified was uh, that we ended up with these just ridiculously overspecified queries that had every term in there and, and no real notion of, of which ones were important or, or, or even how to organize them um, because the topics were so long. And uh, looking at it again, you know, th there's, there's a, most of what's actually important about this, per about this description, yeah, there, there, there's important medical words in there, but like most of what's in there is about how, is about the, is, is, in, is in the linguistic structure of the sentences, right? If you're just looking for, for what words are present or not present, that's not going to actually capture most of what's interesting about this um, person. So, uh, oh, right, okay, there we go. Um, so relying solely on the words gave lousy results. So uh, what we wanted to do was find a way to capture more of that information from the query. And at the same time, we didn't want to go full on into information extraction mode. Because lo looking at, the, at that query, you could easily think about how you could write a program to, like, you know, assuming that the sentences were all about people with diabetes and all about what they didn't want to do and, and, and all about what, what they were complaining about, you could probably write like, with some you know, regular expressions or template matching or some other kind of information extraction approach, pluck out exactly what you wanted and get a good query from that. Uh, topic, but the topics were all so different, and all so, you know, they're, they're over this huge range of medical subjects and formatted in different ways, we needed something that would be generic enough to handle anything and not be overly specific to, say, diabetes-related stuff. So um, what we decided to do for this year is we're, uh, and, and by we, I mean myself and a PhD student, Joel Adams in, in CSLU, are working on using linguistic dependency features um, for retrieval. So what's a linguistic dependency? Uh, it, a dependency grammar is it's a way of formally representing the structure of a sentence at a linguistic level. Um, it stands in contrast to, a, um, well, it describes how the different words in a sentence interact with one another and the function they're playing together in the sentence. This is in contrast to a um, constituency, constituency grammar, if anyone's familiar with that, which is more like the sentence diagramming we all remember from middle school about sort of 
the parts of speech of the words and what what clause what, what, what clause is uh, you know subordinate to what other clause. This is more about the how the, the how they're doing rather than the what. And I have an example here. So here's a sentence: the the aged bottle flies fl flies fast. And here's a constituency parse, and we can see that we have a verb phrase here: flies fast. And what makes it a constituency is is that each of these pieces can be sort of moved around independently within the sentence and have it still make syntactic sense. Um, obviously, swapping the VP and the NP isn't valid in English, but in a more complex sentence, you can see how you can kind of pick pieces around and have it still internally make sense. The dependency parse for that sentence looks like this. And it tells us, th tells us things that the bottle is the subject of flies, and that aged is an adjective modifier on bottle, and so on and so forth. So it's giving us a, 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 a slightly different lens with which to, to pick apart that sentence and think about how, how the words relate to each other. Um, just another example from the, the manual for the dependency parser we used. You know, Bell, based in Los Angeles, makes and distributes electronic computer and building products. And so you can learn things that, you know, Bell is what does the distributing, and that Bell is, you know, based in there, and that the products are electronic or computers, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Um, oh, so the, the question was whether the dependency, dependency parses are position dependent. Uh, they are to the extent that the way you get them is usually by doing a constituency parse, parse first and then doing transforms on that. Um, and uh, if the sentence is, formed, is, is malformed, then you'll get bad results out. Supposedly, it is supposed to be more resistant to things being shuffled around within a sentence, though, as long as it's you know, playing by the syntactic rules. So. Um, and I'll have an example that kind of illustrates that uh, coming up. So our idea was to use these dependencies to hopefully get a more semantically rich representation of the query than just the simple bag of words or, or bag of concepts. Um, and we are working with last year's uh, topics and queries, or I guess the queries are the topics, to try to tune our, try to tune our system and get it working in, in the hopes we'll be able to use it for this year's um, CDS. So, uh, once we have the dependencies, we're not doing anything terribly fancy with the retrieval side. We're basically just doing standard vector space retrieval. We're, we're pretending that the dependencies are words in the, in the, in the document, essentially. Um, and we're doing you know, a, a little bit of processing on there. But that, that part thus far, we haven't done anything too crazy with. Um, this idea is not new. Uh, the first time we found someone thinking about this was in 1984, uh, the SIG-IR. Um, and then it pops up now and again. Dependencies get used heavily for um, other information extraction tasks. They get used for uh, negation detection quite often, grammar detection, all kinds of other things. Um, so they get used for retrieval. It hasn't always been super useful for retrieval. We thought it would be more useful for the retrieval we're doing because, again, our queries are, are longer than a normal IR problem query. And so much of what's going on is about the syntax in the sentence. Um, Thus far, well, well, let's look at one of the topics. This is topic number six from last year, and it's about a, a female with di gal with diabetes and um, doesn't, you know, is not compliant, and she has a skin lesion, and she's tried lotions and creams, but it isn't working and is now oozing. Um, looking at the defensive parts of the sentence, you'll see first of all that that it is that the, the grammar we the, the parser we used was trained on a grammar that is not medical, so it doesn't know about HbA1c, and it also doesn't know about mellitus, and so it. It's not a perfect dependency parse, but it still does capture a lot of useful information, right? We know that the female has the diagnosis, and we know that the diagnosis is of diabetes, even though they're not immediately prox proximal to one another in the sentence. Likewise, we can know some uh, long-range di di uh, um, dependencies, like female and, and the elevated. Um, other sentences, uh, we can capture similar other information. And I'll have, the, if anybody really, really wants to see the details, I can talk later. Just one thing is the types of the dependencies are uh, each dependency parser is sort of implementing a different linguistic formal model, and and this one and each and, and each formal model will have different types of dependencies. And, and ours is the Stanford model, and it's sort of just it's got about thirty or forty classes of, of dependency, and, it, and 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 they're all fairly uh, straightforward grammatical ones. Um, here's a particular in, particularly interesting sentence. It, it figures out that lesion and leg are that, that the, the lesion is on the leg, even though it's way the heck further away in the sentence. That comes in handy later. So uh, our initial results are, pro results are promising. We have increased precision on a number of the topics. Um, we're still not getting amazing results, but we're getting much better results than our, than our Unigram baseline. And what's really, what's really important to me is that the results that we're, 
the articles that we're retrieving that we weren't before are really tricky ones um, that, that we probably would not have been able to get uh, without, without using the dependencies. So for example, on the topic about the, the diabetic woman with the skin lesion, one of the relevant results that we had not retrieved with a simpler model is this one here about a metformin allergy. And um, our Unigram model did uh, retrieve it, but it scored it very, very, very badly and um, didn't, uh, didn't make it into, into the threshold for, for um, including. Uh, but because there's this noun, um, noun, noun lesion skin um, relation uh, in both the query and the document, it picked it up. And you know, it basically is, is mean that the grammatical unit of skin lesion as a thing, right, that, that this is like an actual unit as opposed to just two words, um, is, is being able to weight that more heavily than just two words that, that appeared next to each other. So, I mean, yeah, okay, this example looks like just a fancy way of, get, of, of, of you know, we, we could index bigrams and get the same result for different reasons, but we'd get the same result. But um, here, here's another uh, relevant article for that query that we got back. This is about uh, necrosis lipid, Lipoidica diabetica, I can't even pronounce that, I'm sorry. Um, that bad stuff happening on your leg, uh, on, 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 on lipid, uh, lipid tissue because of um, uh, diabetes, I'm assuming. And we were able to retrieve it because both the query and the document had a preposition relation between lesion and leg. So like lesion on a leg, even though the sentences were completely different. So in ours, right, the lesion, uh, the, the, the dependency comes from this, place here, way far away, and in the document it was, you know, disseminated lesions on the legs. So even a more simplistic engram-based approach would never have picked these up as, as, as being related to one another. The dependency model is capturing that relationship. So we think this is pretty cool and promising, and uh, we'll be curious to see um, where, where it goes uh, from there. So there's a bunch of things we still haven't tried yet. Um, there's those 35 dependency types. We've sort of arbitrarily picked a subset of about 10 or 15 that seem to be most useful, but there's a lot of hand-waving there. We'd like to have better reasons for which ones we're picking and, and, and be able to explain why we're doing it. Uh, I still think it's worthwhile to integrate MetaMap. Maybe we, maybe we would only, maybe upweight dependencies that are, that are involved in mapped concepts or something like that, because maybe those are more important. Um, we haven't taken synonymy into account at all here, but maybe we could try and do something about, you know, maybe dependencies are more similar to one another according to how synonymous the words in them are, perhaps. Um, maybe extremity and leg would be a little bit more closely related than, you know, leg and desk, and uh, it might be able to tell that the dependencies involving extremities and legs are, are related somehow. That's all sort of future stuff. And then sort of to that end, we're experimenting with latent semantic analysis, and so far that hasn't done much for us yet, but it's, 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 it's early days with that. Um, so stay tuned, watch the skies. Uh, there'll be um, more coming from that hopefully in the next few months. Um, and uh, I would ordinarily pause for any questions about that at this point, but I really want to get to the next thing and I don't want to take up everybody's, like I want to go over too much. So uh, if, if you, let's hold questions on the, on the IR part to, to the end and people can come talk to me after. Is that okay? Great. Um, so shifting gears completely. Uh, another area that I'm working in in CSLU is on assistive technology. Um, this work is with Melanie Friedokin and her, uh, t her team in the Institute, Institute on Disability and Development. And the idea here is that uh, there's a wide variety of conditions that result in communication issues, right? Uh, cerebral palsy, people have trouble communicating, um, ALS or other kinds of neurodegenerative diseases. You can get to a place where you can't, you know, can't speak or can't use a computer. So there's a whole area of, 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 of you know, um, of medicine really that's about, you know, coming up with um, alter alternative and augmentative communication technologies for people in these positions, and that's Melanie's group's specialty. So this project is focusing on primary progressive aphasia. So aphasias are uh, an impairment of language affecting the production or comprehension of speech and the ability to read or write. There's a huge number of kinds of aphasias. They happen for all sorts of reasons. Um, the particular kind that we are addressing with this project is primary progressive aphasia, which is also called frontotemporal dementia. And that is a neuro neurodegenerative disease that um, uh, uh, targets neurons that are involved in um, uh, speech and language. And so people who have it have extreme, pro extreme difficulty with word finding. And that gets worse over time, and eventually other, other, neurocogn other cognitive uh, effects kick in, and, and it's actually really tragic and awful. Um, but uh, 
what's interesting about it is it's epidemiology. I mean, well, it's an interesting disease, but also its epidemiology is interesting. So it's relatively rare compared to, uh, like, say, Alzheimer's disease. But uh, among early onset dementias, it's actually overrepresented. So the average age of onset, I think I have um, down here is about 60, which means that you have people who are otherwise quite healthy who suddenly are not able to produce words. And uh, um, it gets worse over time. So it starts off with the, the I, I'm, I'm told it's very much like the feeling of having that word on the tip of your tongue, except it's like that all the time. Um, and so these are people who are not you know, elderly and also sick for lots of other reasons. They're you know generally healthy and now suddenly and are used to kind of working and being out in the world, independent, doing their thing, and now are having this severe uh, severe issue. Um, life expectancy post diagnosis is about seven to ten years, and by the end, the you know the the, the, the dementia does set in. But there, there's a number of years there where they're um, uh, you know still quite functional, except for the whole language thing. And obviously, the language thing has huge effects on um, you know your ability to to sort of get through your life. So Standard treatments um, include communication aids and communication devices. The sort of normal one is, is a picture board or a word board where you've got um, this, this is a screenshot of, of, an, of an app where e each of these is, is a word and you tap the word and, and you can sort of assemble sentences or there's also um, uh, these sorts of displays where it'll have lots of canned phrases and they can kind of point to the one that they're trying to say or seeing it will sort of jog their, you know, uh, sort of jog their word recall a little bit. Um, these kinds of standard approaches have some problems. Uh, they're often completely static in nature, meaning you get one out of the box, it has what it has, and that's it. Or you configure it when you first get it with your speech pathologist, and they work with you to figure out, you and, your, and usually a spouse or some other you know, family member, to figure out what words you need to be able to say. And they program it in, and that's what you have. And uh, if you want to talk about something else that day, you're out of luck. Um, and also the images, so a lot of them do have these image, images where you can put, you know, images of your, you know, your spouse or your child or, you know, the, the thing, you know, the, uh, the remote control, you know, stuff you might, you might want to talk about you can preload in. But they're preloaded and the way the interfaces for these are set up is not all easy for the patient or the user um, or their caregivers to do, to do any of the programming. Um, it generally has to be done by the clinician. Huge pain. And as a result, the patients basically don't use them. Um, or they underutilize them. And that we saw as a problem. And so um, our solution is we're building a what we're calling a just-in-time picture board. The idea is the users can take their own darn pictures because it's 2015 and we all have phones in our pockets and iPads. And if we're talking about 60-year-olds, they've all been carrying around smartphones for the last five years at this point and, and know perfectly well how to take a picture. Um, even completely non-tech literate 60-year-olds in 2015, like, that's okay. But I, I, I'll, I'll just say, like, that, that is one of, one of the things that even people who don't know anything about, else about their smartphone, like many, many people who don't know anything about, about their smartphone do know how to take a picture. And um, so that's, uh, we, we see that as like a fairly achievable goal. Um, and and, and uh, uh, so anyway, they take a picture. The problem is they still can't describe the picture. So short of having their clinician uh, follow them around and after they take the picture, type in the annotations, you know, how do you do it? Well, we have found a way for there to be real-time annotation. And um, the way we do it, uh, very, very neat. So our model is that we have our user. There's a scene of interest that they're going to want to tell somebody about later, right? So picture, imagine that you have PPA and you're at home and your spouse is out shopping and the FedEx person comes. And you, of course, can't talk to the FedEx person to, you know, to, to you know, for what you can't talk to the FedEx person so you don't answer the door and they go. And you want to tell your spouse that the, that the FedEx person came and that they should call FedEx and schedule a, a, a redelivery. You're, your picture board does not have FedEx things programmed into it. So um, your scene of interest is the FedEx person at the door, you know, waving frantically. And uh, your communication partner is, say, your spouse when they come back from the store. Um, we add in another, part, another group of participants to this, which is the friends and family of the affected individuals. Um, we initially also thought about maybe Mechanical Turk. Uh, that's later. Um, but for now, we're, we're talking about friends and family. And the idea is we'll have them do the annotations. So the, the user takes the picture, goes off into the cloud. Our, uh, the, you know, their friends and family annotate it, and it gets sent back to the tablet. And um, I'll talk more about the details of how that happens uh, in a bit. But I just want to say the reason we're doing friends and family is besides obviously affecting an individual's ability to speak, it ha PPA has a huge impact on their sort of social life, so to speak. Right? Um, it's very, very common for people with PPA to lose touch with friends because they 
can't carry on a conversation. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's really it's very isolating and very challenging, both for the affected um, patient, but also their family and, 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 and their caregiver. And so by uh, including the friends and family, that helps everybody stay connected, right? People, people who, uh, you know, know, people whose friends get PPA often report that they, you know, that they would love to, to stay more in touch with the friend, but it's just hard because they can't really talk. We think this might be a way to kind of help bridge that gap by involving them in their communication. So the model works like this. We've got the user, they have their tablet computer, they take a picture of the scene of interest. The photo and the metadata get uploaded to our annotation server where it gets sent to their friends and family. Um, we're thinking about things like fa Facebook integration, so the picture shows up you know, in their feed and they can write a, write a comment. Uh, or maybe there's a dedicated app and their phones buzz and say, hey, you know, Jane just took a new picture. Can you write a, write a descriptive comment of it for her? The idea, of course, is we would sort of, you know, the friends would sort of ahead of time agree to be doing this, right? You, you, you'd, you know, ask, ask you know, 10 friends if they'd be willing to help, help out with this. And so that way the idea would, it would be that people would be around to do it. Um, the uh, captions get sent back, or the comments get sent back to the annotation server, where from there we use natural language processing to analyze the free text comments and come up with a set of relevant, uh, relevant words that describe what's going on in the picture that we think the user might want to you know, use to describe what they're seeing. Those get sent back to the server, which sends them back to the tablet. And then um, from there, they will be able to communicate with their, with their person. So it's not exactly real time, but the idea is, you know, with, you know, pr probably within an hour or two, you could get something back from, from friends and family. And um, that would be, you know, rapid enough for, for many use cases. Obviously, it wouldn't solve everything, but it would, but it, it would be pretty darn useful, we think. So um, this is actually a mock-up of, of, of the app. I'll be de demoing the real thing here in a minute, hopefully. Um, but the idea is, you see, it looks just much like any of the other uh, picture boards that I showed screenshots of. I like to think a little bit less, uh, a, little, a little bit less ugly. Um, and the idea is you have a picture, and then there's words surrounding it. There's actually a lot of literature in the AAC world about how to organize these words, how many words there should be. Um, we're, we're exploring a number of different kind of design options there. Um, so this is a picture of a delicious bowl of pho, and so we have lots of you know, pho-related words. Uh, here's a picture of, of, of Kyle, who's a, the, 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 the other faculty member who was working on this with me, who's now at Google. Um, and he's out in the park drinking tea, and so we have, you know, relevant words there. Um, so the current status is we have that we have an R R21, we're in the middle of uh, the first year of an R21 um, from the NIDCD, um, and we're building the NLP engine, uh, the goal of which is to, given those, again, given those comments, identify a set of words that we would want to put around it. Um, and uh, we're also building the app and the annotation system with help from Oaktree. Um, which is being very, very useful. And the next step that is, the, that is planned in the grant is once we have the app built, we're going to be doing a small-scale pilot study using a single subject design where the users are their sort of own controls um, with about, uh, I think we're shooting for 10 subjects. Um, the idea is we'll have them attempt to, you know, we'll have them together with an RA be out doing a thing. We'll have them take some pictures of whatever it is, uh, the, the task that they're doing, and then come back and try and tell their partner about it using our app. Then have them do kind of a similar activity uh, without, without the support of the app, and then also a version just with the picture to prompt them, not without any of the words or, or the other things. So we're working on the experimental design for that to figure out how to, how to, make, it, um, uh, how to, how to make it all work. Um, so for the pilot, we're not using friends and family for the annotation. That, 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 we thought that was sort of unfeasible given the, the time and budget constraints. So we're just using RAs as, to sort of stand in for that. Um, the outcomes are things like how many target words are they producing. So for each interaction, the RAs are coming up with what kinds of words ought they to be saying to describe what they were doing. Like, for example, if it was the going out for Vietnamese food, we might expect pho to be one of the words, or soup, or something like that. So of the target words, how many are they producing? Honestly, just how many words are they producing? Um, there's a sort of school of thought in, in, in PPA treatment that is any words they say are good words, right? Just getting them talking at all is, 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 is apparently uh, a pretty big achievement. And so um, we're, we're looking to just produce speech in general. Um, so, uh, I want to talk briefly about how that NLP engine works. Um, so we have these words, and let's say that the comments on that picture were things like, like this, right? So we know that some of these words are quite relevant, and we're actually, um, you know, well, let's say, that, let's say that these were the words we picked up. Uh, 
not all the words we might like to pick, have on the board, though, are in these comments, right? We might, we might say that these are some of the more relevant words, but there's a bunch of stuff that we might want that isn't, isn't directly in the comments. So we have to ha have a way to introduce new words to the equation. Um, so for example, no one said coffee. They said cup of joe, but they didn't say coffee. And probably somebody wanting to tell, tell about the scene will probably want to, you know, coffee would be like a, a, a much more likely and much more, you know, simple uh, word. So uh, our idea is to try to basically expand, it, work, from the, work, from the, work from the comments and come up with a set of semantically related words um, that has a couple properties. It needs to maximize relevance, so similarity between the words that we suggest and the words in the comment, while at the same time minimizing redundancy because we don't want to have 10 synonyms for coffee. That won't help anybody. So we need a, a diverse set of words, but they have to be highly relevant. Um, so uh, a optimal um, solution, uh, well, just to highlight even more, if a maximally relevant solution will have lots of words that are just like the, the, the comments, but will be very redundant. A maximally diverse one will have um, a, a huge variety of words that might not, might not be very relevant, but they'll be very different from one another. So we want to try to balance these two, maximizing relevance while minimizing redundancy. So more formally, we, uh, we, we can look at it this way. We want to find the, the maximize the weighted difference, right? And the, weight, the weighting parameter here is tunable, so if we, we, we can kind of find the right balance between relevance and redundancy uh, on, on a sort of per, um, well, on a, on a per suggestion basis. Uh, you, can have, you can think of a, a dozen different ways to try to come up with that parameter, and that's all future, future work. Um, the relevancy and, relevance and redundancy functions we're defining using um, uh, a fairly simple IR-influenced model. So the relevance of a suggestion to a query is just for each suggested term, how similar is that term to the query, and then summed up. Um, the redundancy function is very similar, except it's the, 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 the sum of the term to all the other terms for the redundancy. Um, we're using the word to vec uh, semantic vector embedding model um, that has been all the rage lately. It uses recurrent neural networks uh, and actually gets really interesting results. So the way they first evaluated it was on a uh, analogy-solving task. So the task is you get Athens is to Greece as Oslo is to what? Um, or, you, or it might have actually just been you get Athens is to Greece and you need to find two words that are, that are, that are you know, in the same relationship. It actually worked you know, very, very well. Um, I can, if anyone's interested, I can go into more detail about how that works later on. But the idea then is, is we, we use that to uh, compute that, uh, the, the similarity function. We just use the word to vec embedded model and say, for this word, how similar is it to these other words? Um, the uh, problem with this sort of approach is um, finding an op optimal solution is NP-complete, <laughs> it turns out, um, which is sad, uh, because that means that it's probably not tractable to find an optimal approach, right? It, 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 it's, it's, it's analogous to a covering problem, right? Because there's a very large number of possible words, and um, exhaustively exp exploring the space is, 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 is exponentially hard. So uh, we're, uh, well, the good news, though, is that there's a, a, a ton of algorithms that try to you know, come up with approximate solutions, that, which is what we're, right now we're using a fairly simple greedy algorithm, but we're exploring with a number of other ones. And actually, we just found out that there is a, uh, IBM has a linear, linear programming solver that um, claims to be able to solve these kinds of things optimally and, and in a feasible amount of time. So we'll, we'll, we'll see if that works. So um, right now, we have a fairly simple system working. So from this picture, let's say we had these comments. So this is actually real data. This is from our, our we had our, our research team give us a few pictures and then generate some comments so that we could use them to kind of tweak our model. So these are the comments, and our, our things suggest the following words. So that's pretty good, right? Um, you know, if you, had the, if you had this picture and I just told you that these were the words I was going to give you to prompt to talk about it, those would all be fairly reasonable, right? So. Um, what I thought I would do is, is, is put on the safety goggles here and attempt a live demo. And before I hook up the iPad, if people have laptops open. Anybody, anybody wants to try to go to that address? Um, and I probably should have thought more about how to, uh, let's see, does that work? Does that still work? Okay, it still works, good. The server is still running, excellent. Um, it did not, did not crash during the course of, of the talk. Okay, so anybody who, who cares has, has seen that? Or should I leave it up for another second? Okay.
Yeah, port 3000, and I, I, I do apologize for not having a, an easier to, to deal with URL. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. That, ugh. my bad. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> well, this is just running off my laptop right now. So, yes, thank you very much. So, so Matt, who pointed that out, is the Oak Tree developer who has uh, been helping out amazingly with the, web, with the website of things. Okay. Some of them are rather large images, yes. Uh, er, well, er, earlier, uh, earlier versions did not scale the images down, and it turns out that, um, oh, yes, yes, you may allow an incoming connection. Am I using up all my Verizon data by downloading this image? If you're on the Wi-Fi, then well, are you able to access it? Yeah. Well, oh, it's hanging. That's probably yeah, so you have to be on the Wi-Fi. This is just running, like I said, on Hawkeye on my laptop, so okay. Anyway, my computer decided that it didn't want to show that slide anymore anyway, so I will just trust that a few of you have it open. And I'm going to hook up the tablet. And, okay. So, it looks basically like, just in its current form, like any photo list, right? And now I'm going to take a new photo. Now, we observed that um, some of our initial tests uh, re oh, dang it. revealed that... Um, Hitting a small target, initially had this be the button to add a photo. That is a, apparently, well, not apparently, obviously, it's way too small for, for somebody, especially if they have any kind of motor difficulty to hit. So now we've got a nice big um, button. And it also does not require you to uh, use Apple's um, annoyingly, uh, it turns out, that there's a, once you actually count, there's a lot of tapping involved in taking it. I know I said it was super easy to take a picture, but it turns out there's a lot of tapping involved. So I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to take a picture here. I'm going to try taking another here. Let's take one of Bill. All right. There we go. Come on. Oh, yes, thank you. All right. Awesome. Okay, so we've got a picture of Bill. Um, a blurry picture of Bill, but we have two blurry pictures of Bill. Okay, I see people are writing comments. This is excellent. Um, so on the website now, hopefully that new picture appeared. Did it? Anybody who's looking at it? It uploaded, good. So one of these, I'm seeing some people writing comments, which is good, or loading it. So if, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, I'll switch back to the laptop so we can all see. So hold, hold that thought about what the interface looked like. As soon as we took the picture, it uploaded it to the website. And if I go to the website, now we have our picture of Bill. And the idea here is that we could write comments. You know, what a nice department. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not mirroring. All right. What a nice department. Um, this is a riveting talk. <laughs> and nobody is asleep. Okay, good. So, oh, hang on. I'm going to do one one more here. The room is full. Good. And did it? Okay, what's supposed to happen, um, and I have a, a Potemkin demo with screenshots. It, for, it was working immediately before the talk, and now it is not working, and I don't know why. Um, is this 93? This is 93. Let's try one more. Huh. Okay. What normally happens and what's supposed to happen is the tablet is supposed to be receiving the comments in real time, and it was happening right before the talk. You know, go figure. Um, and oddly is not now. And then the idea is on the tablet... It might be, I think, maybe my tablet's Wi-Fi hiccuped. I don't know. Um, 
So from here, if, if, the, if it was doing what it's supposed to do, which of course it isn't, um, it gets sent back down and uh, there's the, the, the words appear, you see the comments on the side, and then there's a synthesizer built in, right? Which is much more interesting when it's saying things like soup. Um, but I have, I, have, I have a screenshot of it doing that earlier today, so um, let me go back to Keynote. Okay, there we go. So this is what it looks like when it's actually working. Um, and, and it's really neat. You can, it, as, as new comments come in, you see the words change in real time. I have no idea why it isn't working, probably because it knew I was demoing it. Um, but always prepared, have a screenshot, right? And so the idea is the user will have this and they'll be able to take it with them and if they are prompt, you know, if alone jogs their memory and that's what they want to say, they can say it or they can just tap the button and the tablet will say it for them. Um, we have all kinds of other ideas for the interface uh, that we want to do. Um, the NLP engine, the next step with it is we realized that just adding new words into the equation isn't sufficient because often, even though the words from the comments don't always have everything we want, they often will still have useful words and the system as it is right now just suggests new ones um, or, or rather, yeah, so just, just suggest, suggest new ones. So we're working on identifying the most relevant words from the, from the comments. We're also working on recognizing noun phrases and proper nouns. So if they say, I'm having coffee with Bill, uh, Bill would, would be one of the choices because it would know that Bill is a name and therefore you probably want to talk about who's in the, who's in the picture. Dave. So I, I don't know if this is relevant to your particular problem, but it, it seems like, uh, and maybe I didn't understand your, how you unpack relevance for this, but you clearly, like with coffee, you're, you're finding a synonym of a word that was on the um, search, on the query, but mm -hmm. you're picking that synonym for some reason. I wonder, one, how you do that, and two, is it, if it's by frequency, it seems like that's a way to solve your uh, algorithmic issues for the time it takes, the incompleteness, completeness, because you could have a much smaller subsets of words that are much more frequently used, a little bit adapted, like you said, for their mm -hmm. common friends and family or other proper nouns, rather than trying to solve this whole entire um, you know, lexical space just by saying any word could show up here. So even for a fairly small number of, number of words, it blows up okay. exponentially. But that, that, that is a good idea. Um, that, is, that is a very good idea. And I think there's some optimizations we could do along those lines. As to the first part of your question about how we decide kind of what's relevant, that's what we're still figuring out. Okay. Um, I think uh, what we'll end up doing in the end is probably giving a lot more weight to th words that are actually in the comments that, that seem, especially if it's a word that multiple comments uh, you know, include or, a, or a, a, a set of very closely related words that a lot of the comments include. We want to make sure to include one of those. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of fine tuning about that. Uh, Part of what I think is so interesting about this project is, it, unlike many other NLP things, there's kind of an, an obvious evaluation story here, right? Um, it's easy to have a human look at it and, and rate whether this set of words is better than that set of words. It, we even have like a fully extrinsic pipeline planned out where we have you know, users and we have a, fair, a number of fairly good objective measures for you know, measuring how, you know, how well they're doing using the system. And that, that, that's, that's, so you know, in principle, if we had two different algorithms that we wanted to try for coming up with these words, we could experimentally, you know, investigate that in a way that is fairly uncommon in a lot of NLP um, tasks. So, anyway, um, that's. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry the demo didn't work there. Uh, it, I swear it really was working five minutes before the. Like I tried it right before the the, the talk. Um, anyway, that's um, that's what I wanted to cover. Uh, I'm just over time. It looks like so. I'll take questions, but first I want to thank the people I've been working with. So obviously for the IR piece, we have um, Bill and Aaron and Trace Hedinger and uh, Kate Boltals for all the Trek stuff, and then Joel Adams and um, Golnar Sheikhshab and Joseph Hamilton, our CSLU students who work with me on, on this or other IR projects um, in, the, in the past. And then um, on the AAC stuff, we have Melanie and her whole team, Amy and Glory and Betts and, and uh, Kyle, and also the Oak Tree uh, folks who've been really amazing and, and, and really done a lot of good work on the website. So, oh, and of course, the, the funders um, who are paying for it, which is really kind of awesome. So anyway, um, that's uh, what I had for today. And I'll be more than happy to take any questions that people haven't already asked. Yeah.
Okay. Please. You said that one of the uh, problems or things that would benefit you in doing this is having more text. So I wonder how, if you could reference, like Google Images has a lot of people going in and texting, the, writing text for those images. If you could use that as a source to pull, like send it your most common or most interesting words, see what other relevant words you get relative to other people matching with those images, and therefore get a better list of like secondary words that you can. So you, you, you let me rephrase if I understand quite right. You're, you're saying we should take the picture, run it through Google Images, see what other related images are, and use words from that? Or the words that your algorithm picks out as more relevant in your comments and try to get more words from. Oh, I see. Do, an, do a Google Images search with those words as the query and then take, yeah. That's definitely something, those kinds of ideas are things we're thinking about. We're also looking into, there, there's been a lot of progress in the last two years on automatic image captioning. Um, it's still, uh, um, much better at like describing the um, objects in an image than what they're doing with each other, right? It'll say uh, many people will lined up in a line, and that'll be factually correct, but it'll be missing the point that they're all waiting in line to get into a movie theater or something like that. Um, but we're we're thinking about trying to integrate those kinds of automated solutions as well. So yeah, that's that's definitely a good uh, a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Can you, can the user like remove words from the list? Mm -hmm. Is there yeah. That's on the plan is some kind of relevance feedback from the user saying, nope, you know, swiping, uh, God, what are, I was saying there's some app now that people use for dating where you like swipe left or, yeah, where, 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 so something like that for the words where, see, I'm, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm apparently old and don't know about these things. And so, uh, but the idea is that they, they, you know, swipe one way on the words to make them go away and then get a new set of suggestions, something like that. Um, we're also thinking about, uh, having some kind of more organization for it. So, you know, maybe it shows the 10, but then there'll be you know sections at the bottom like verbs or you know more names or you know th th things along along those lines. Um, that's all stuff that we're sort of we, we have a bucket of ideas we're calling uh, you know this is the R01 bucket. So all, all stuff that we're going to put in we, when we when we apply for an R01 to to continue the work. It's actually been very um, educational for me to see how much you have to constrain to fit into an R21. Uh, we, we had many grandiose visions that we've sort of chopped off to to fit in, a, in on the timeline. Yeah. Have you ever considered the possibility of some sort of um, crowdsourcing mm -hmm. way of, of generating your? At, our, our first thought initially was Mechanical Turk, actually. For, for, that was our very first thought. And then um, the, the clinicians thought that the problem with Mechanical Turk would be that the Turkers, I, I guess they were, they were, their, their intuition was a lot of the pictures people are going to want to take will be of like friends or family or, or stuff that the Turkers won't have enough context to interpret. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't use them, though. I, 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 th I think there's definitely a role for crowdsourcing to play. Um, I mean, the more comments, the better, right? And then we can talk about, well, do we weight ones from friends and family more heavily than ones from Mechanical Turk or, you know, things along those lines. Um, that's definitely something we want to experiment with, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I guess the idea of... Oh, right. Sorry. I'm new to this. So, this disease is progressive, which means at some point, they're probably, these patients have... Um, some access to words. Is there a thought, I mean, I guess more in the future of sort of recording the words they typically use and having, working from a more redu reduced um, mm. dictionary? Well, that's an idea. They, yeah. they, they, they certainly do things like voice banking for other degenerative diseases. I don't know that anyone's tried that with PPA. This would be a really good way to elicit that, though. Um, you know, part of what we want to do with this is as a user uses it over time, they'll be building up a, a, a personalized library of scenes and words that they, that they can refer back to. And certainly somebody in the earlier stages, we could be saving that and, and, and using, using those for sure. Um, you know, we also have ideas about you know, maybe looking at their, uh, you know, getting writing samples or looking at their contacts on their, on their device and, and seeing you know, what, what names should we be looking out for specifically. Um, or email correspondence. Or email correspondence, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Good idea. Uh, okay. Um, oh, okay. I actually had sort of three recommendations or things you might put in that bucket. Um, one is it might be interesting to cluster similar words so that mm -hmm. they can, you know, drill down. Another interesting idea is allowing the user to annotate the image so they can, you know, circle what they want That's, to focus uh, on. Yes. And another idea might be 
allowing sort of crowdsourcing within the group of people who have anaphasia? Maybe not so much offering up words, but having a word sharing program. So if someone sees an image, they go, I think this bucket of words applies. Oh, that's, an, that's a really cool idea, yeah. So the, uh, the, the, the first two are definitely ones we want to do, especially the one about um, letting the user indicate when they take the picture, OK, no, uh, I really want you know, the, the computers what I'm trying to talk about, not all the people in the background. You know, give, being able to communicate that to their um, annotators uh, is, is definitely something we want to do. The, uh, um, for sure. The last one, though, about having some kind of like shared library of photos among all the users of the app or something, that's a really neat idea. Um, we hadn't, I hadn't thought of that one. That's very cool. Yeah. So maybe you can sure. stick around the people. That yes, I can certainly stick around. So thank you, everyone, for your attention. Thank you.